coffee is first domesticated, cultivated, made into something that is either we love or we hate in what is now Ethiopia, Kenya, that region of the world there. This map that I found, when Tariq posted, I was interested in the history of this. This website actually gives you a, a pretty good kind of approximation of what happened to coffee. And for those of you who did uh, your web posts, some of you came up with some great information. Sometimes I wondered where you got the information. I always try, if I'm being nice, to give a link to the people that I'm taking information from. So if you can pop a link in there when you have information, that's always nice. A lot of times you'll just be referencing your textbook and that's fine. And then you'll just tell us about a quote from your textbook. But if you get information from somewhere else, you can tell us about it. So coffee, or these cherries, these beans, originate in Africa. And then they go over here into this area of the world, into Yemen and India. You will notice that it is later on, that about the same time that coffee appears in Europe, it also starts to be cultivated in the Caribbean and in Brazil and in South America. A lot of this has to do with the Dutch. The Dutch are kind of a hidden, we, not too many people know about the Dutch. I guess we do a little bit. Those of us who are around in upstate New York, we have these weird names for things like Catskills and stuff like that that came to us from the Dutch. But the Dutch established coffee in Indonesia and in parts of the Caribbean. And France is also a player in that, as we'll find out. And the Portuguese must have been a player in that because there they are in Brazil. And so coffee becomes something that is established later on, in much later uh, than in Ethiopia and in Kenya, in Europe and in what we consider Latin America in sort of 17, 1720s around then. Now, in the places where it is grown and was first used here, it was not sweetened. It was actually just drank or roasted for its own qualities. Adding sugar to coffee is a European thing. They were the ones who added sugar to coffee. And it is probably no coincidence that this happens with the establishment of huge sugar plantations in Latin America and the Caribbean. Sugar was also an exotic commodity for the Europeans. It was the word for sugar actually comes to us from azúcar, which is a Spanish word, but it's not a Spanish word because it's from Arabic. It's a word in Spanish, but it's a word that they borrowed from Arabic because of course Spain, and the Iberian Peninsula was ruled by the Islamic Empire for a very long time. And there are various words in Spanish like ojalá, may Allah grant that, and Hamas, and azúcar, which are evidence of this interchange and the fact that Islam was in Europe for a very long time. So sugar was seen as this exotic commodity, was very expensive. It was only something that the kings and queens and the rich people had. But with the establishment of these plantations in the Americas, sugar becomes a much more available commodity. And when you combine sugar and coffee, then you got something, right? I mean, coffee by itself is great, but you give it that extra caffeine plus sugar punch and you can do more. You can be happier. You can work harder. You can do more things. The Europeans did this with several different things. Tea, for example, which some of you admitted to drink, was also in its native lands, not used with sugar in it. The Brits had the great idea to just sweeten that thing way up, and then you get the same, not quite as much caffeine, but you still get that, boom, sugar punch, little caffeine punch. Later, again, cacao, or what gives us chocolate, 
is domesticated in this part of the world was not sweetened when the Aztecs and others were using it as a, as a sacred drink. But of course, later on, the Europeans are able to add sugar to that and boom, now you got something. You got this new drink that you can use and you can work harder and you can get more out of people. I say this because every time we drink a cup of coffee, it's already a global commodity. And it's been global for at least 300 years, perhaps more. But in certainly in the form that we know it, this is a, a long thing. And so when we get coffee, we are participating in this global exchange with every cup we have. Louisa, you noted that these ingredients for coffee, like say sugar and the coffee itself, might come from, where are they all from? It, it can vary on so many different levels because, um, you know, they can come from like the grocery store and then the grocery store gets it from somewhere else. And then, you know, it, it's kind of like um, hunting down like, Hunting down an answer that you might not get to the answer to. Um, that's kind of where I was getting that. Hunting down an answer that you might not get to the answer to. Yeah, I mean, you know, and some people lie to you about where things are from. I just actually, oh, I remember this now. My coffee grinder, they said it was from Austria, but now I am participating in a class action lawsuit. Because I don't know even where they built it, but they charged me $7.50 more and said it was from Austria. And then it turns out they were lying to me. They were built it from somewhere else. So I hope I get my $7.50 back. Somebody caught them. Yes. Well, I believe a lot of the issue is there's a difference between raw goods and manufactured goods, where um, raw goods are usually taken from countries that don't make it into a finished product. They simply export, whether it be raw coffee beans or raw sugar cane or whatever else. And then they send it to a place like Austria that sort of mixes it all together in a factory and then you have a finished product. So it's kind of from both places, really. Yeah, I mean, that's that's certainly true of a lot of things that there's this, uh, you know, there's a kind of separation between the places of extraction and the places of where things get, you know, like chocolate and then the Swiss get all put their machines and do their Swiss thing and make it into something. And that is true of many things. Curiously with sugar though, sugar is a really interesting commodity in the fact that you had to harvest it and process it on site, on the plantation, because if you didn't, it was gonna lose its sugar content. So they actually had to make it into sugar or molasses or something so that it then could be shipped out. So it's an interesting process. A lot of, or some people, one of uh, an anthropologist named Sidney Mintz that I made Amy read in uh, the last time that we were together um, claims, and I think with reason, that there were basically on these sugar plantations, they had to have a certain factory operation in order to turn that sugar cane into sugar, and that these factory forms predated the Industrial Revolution. And that in fact, the Industrial Revolution in Europe, in some ways was copying the kinds of forms that were developed, the kinds of clockwork mechanisms carried out by enslaved Africans, by the way, but to perfection in order to uh, produce sugar for Europe. And so that in fact, the sugar from Latin America and Brazil and these places, the colonies, would not only fuel the workers of the Industrial Revolution, they also copied the stuff that was going on in the colonies by then. It's an unusual thing. It's different than a lot of the other things where stuff is extracted and then processed later by, by different kinds of workers. But uh, yeah, that's what happens. Amy, you said, Something about the coffee that we even get here or that it comes from somewhere else? It comes from three different companies from Peach Coffee. Really? Uh, Peach Coffee, which is from JC. Um, upstairs, they get it from three different countries. One is including Guatemala, and they import it to the main station in uh, California, and then import it throughout the country. All right. Well, there you go. 
So, yeah, we have a global thing going on. Now, I already told you, so this is not a not a, a mystery anymore because we've been talking about sugar so much. But when it comes to people who were enslaved and dragged from Africa, almost the great majority of those people were brought to the Americas in order to process and grow and cut sugar cane. It was, sugar is perhaps the major, perhaps the most, I think I might have to say the most, the, the crop that people have been moved around the most for is sugar. And so if you look, this map actually gives you kind of the scale of how things are going. If you look at Brazil alone, which is also, by the way, where we get most of the world's coffee. That's where approximately, if I'm not mistaken, at least around 4 million of the enslaved Africans were taken to Brazil, most of them to work on uh, sugar plantations. Several small islands of the Caribbean, like Jamaica, like San Domingue, got brought in more enslaved Africans than the entire continent of North America. We will later read about enslavement in the United States, which most people associate with cotton, but in terms of the, the vast majority of enslaved Africans, they were brought to the Americas for sugar. The United States, <laughs> And we'll, again, we'll read about this. It, it's, we did not, the United States did not import a large number at the outset. Like I said, there were tiny islands in the Caribbean, which each got many more enslaved Africans in the United States. What was peculiar about the enslavement in the United States is that, and this is, you know, I actually had a chance to listen to this book on Audible, uh, is that people figured out a way that they tried to extend from generation to generation enslavement and basically breed more enslaved persons. A particularly sick form of enslavement, which other people didn't weren't able to do in other parts of the world. Most of the people who were brought into these other countries were brought to work and the average lifespan of a person who was brought to work on a sugar plantation was seven years. And so although demographically people did survive and people did reproduce, they did not necessarily reproduce as enslaved persons in the same way they did, were that was used in the United States, which did not import as many, but did try this whole like breed and sell, which is, like I said, particularly insidious and perhaps has something to do with the way in which this is part of our national uh, psychology in, in ways that it may not be obvious in other parts of Latin America. But like I said, in terms of how this happened, in terms of the, the, the trade, these were the, these, these were the places where the bulk of people went to. This is people cutting sugarcane, which was one of the hardest, most deadliest jobs, uh, work that you could do. And that's why people were brought in almost continuously. This is a, a rendering of the plantations of San Domingue, one of the most profitable colonies that the French had. That's why they get the name San Domingue. A small island in the Caribbean producing as much sugar, coffee, indigo, and cotton as Brazil and Jamaica combined in its heydays. This was the jewel in the crown of the French Empire. Napoleon loved this place because it gave him a lot of money from all these plantations and stuff. Of course, where? Saint-Domingue, yes, is Haiti. The 
second independent country in the Americas. First, the United States. Second, Haiti. The only successful slave revolution which overthrew a colonial power, beat the army of Napoleon. He sent another army in to re-enslave them and they drove them into the sea. An incredible feat on an incredible place that many people don't even know about. I mean, if I ask what's the second independent country in the, in the Americas, most people wouldn't know, but it was, was crucial to the other countries in Latin America becoming independent was also one of the only places in the world where the enslaved persons threw off their chains and started their own country. Ever since it's been burdened with debt, the, the loss of life and the, you know, what they had to do with the plantations was basically burn them to achieve their freedom, made it, today we think about Haiti, we often think of a place that is mired in, in poverty and, and, and sadness, and, and those things are true, but we should always remember that this was an enormously wealthy place. And that if it hadn't been for the Haitian Revolution, then Napoleon would have hardly wanted to sell the Louisiana Purchase to Jefferson for a pittance. He would have hung on to that. But it was, since he didn't have Haiti, he lost that. He decided it wasn't worth it to try and keep New Orleans in the whole, that whole big mass of what to him wasn't very useful land. So we owe the Haitians the fact that the United States was able to successfully and quickly expand westward at the pace that it did. But usually we don't. Anybody, did they teach you that when they, you did the Louisiana Purchase in school? Did you thank the Haitians? Yeah, usually not. Learned about both of them, but not the connection. Yeah, yeah, it's usually, they are starting to teach a little bit more about the Haitian Revolution, the age of revolutions, but that's the problem. People you don't know, make these connections enough. So, there we go. Now, so the first answers I got from the people who like coffee, like me, but I have to say that in the real world, the coffee haters are correct because of just all the suffering and stuff that coffee brings to us. Right, Josie, who has to work for this coffee? I mean, I, I don't necessarily dislike coffee for that reason. I dislike coffee because I don't like the taste of it. But yeah, that too. That too. So we have all the people that are laboring to bring us the coffee in these places. And, oh. and Paige, if you had to get your coffee from Duncan, where is that coffee coming from? Yeah, Brazil is a big supplier, I think, of the, especially the Duncan coffee. I always consider myself you know, I think I'm, I don't like to go to Duncan because of that, that Brazilian grown coffee because let's see, Tiana, who's growing those beans? What's it like for them? Um, not that good when they're like the barber who's actually talking to them because they get a lot of injuries and so they like sunburns and like, and dangers from like the chemicals and stuff that treat the coffee beans but also like wages usually aren't really fair because of like the power dynamic and you'll they'll kind of accept anything as long as they're getting paid and that allows them to be taken advantage of and usually they get paid really well so they're not having like a good quality of life yeah usually not good true katrina <clears throat> true yeah, yeah. Turns out, especially in Brazil, it always makes me sad. I mean, pretty much, you know, I mean, I, one always ha hesitates to use the word slavery in the present day because too many people 
say slavery when they don't know what they're talking about. But actually, it turns out that some of these people are working in near enslavement conditions. And that, you know, it it has been discovered that a lot of, you know, especially in Brazil, I'm sure there are good places in Brazil too, but you know, a lot of it is uh, is not so great. I usually try to cut the ad out when I put these things up, but I thought that this person needed to her morning jump start of coffee before you shop for a laptop. So there you go. Right by the coffee beans, you have, I need my coffee. So yeah, I think the people who hate coffee for various reasons are basically correct. However, we should be, Shailen, it doesn't all have to be terrible, does it? No, why not? Give us a good, give us a good story. Um, so yeah, I looked into Pete's Coffee and they have a, I forget what it's called, but they have like a program set up where they, they like to partner up with um, like family owned smaller farms and stuff around the world to assist them in creating like a higher quality coffee bean. So what they do is they'll go in, they'll work with them and assist them and help them harvest better, help them get the resources to like make a really good product and then they'll continue to partner with them and this uh it, it's like they use sustainable methods so it um creates a really healthy eco like a healthy environment and um sustainable practices so that they can both kind of economically profit for future for the future years. So, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, it can be good, right? I mean, you know, it's a good crop to farm and it can be tough, but you know, some people are able to forge these kinds of alliances and use it, you know, they're probably not getting super rich, but you know, there might be, might be better to do that than growing, I don't know, it might be better than growing coca or something else that helps to stimulate and jumpstart your mornings every so often. You know, these kinds of things are, can be helpful. So I looked up, there you go, Los Cafeteros blend. We're, yeah, we're the cafeteros. We're out there being all nice to people. Now, they could be lying to us. It's always possible. But, you know, it's better to, it's better to at least try. It's better to at least try. I was also thinking, you know, I think about my mornings. I posted about my own coffee habits. I feel so virtuous. There's my Chemex, not mine, but that's what it looks like. I use this Chemex thing and I have my paper blender, I mean my paper thing, and then I throw that in the compost and it like turns into dirt. I feel great. Get that fair trade coffee, help a few farmers out in the morning, turn my coffee, you know. But I thought about it when I was reading your comments and you know, this is like one of the wonderful tricks of capitalism, right? You spend so much time focused on the aesthetics of the end product and your little food and wine your your Chemex container and your, you feel so good when you throw that in a compost and it turns into dirt. But the fact of the matter is, right, that's like the end, the little end part of the chain. I'm not doing that much good here. It's not, I'm not saving the world. I'm just kind of probably rich and feeling good about myself here. <laughs> I don't have to go down to Dunkin' so I can buy this overpriced coffee and feel like I'm doing something good in the world. And it turns out, I was just reading, by the way, I don't want to make us sad, but it turns out that this recycling stuff that we do, eh, it's better than not, but it's not a big deal in terms of like what you do in terms of your consumption. If you wanted to help the planet the most in the kitchen, in terms of what you eat, drink, and your practices, what's the best thing, what's the most effective choice that you could make in your, in your kitchen? If you're purely going by the planet, you wanted to help the earth, what would you do? Oh, people are scared. What's the most effective food choice or cooking practice that I can do in my own life? Don't worry, I'm scared too. I don't want to do it. It makes me sad. I don't even want to say it because I'm not going to do it. Yeah. 
make sure you're not eating too much? Um, well, I can eat as much as I want of uh, kale and everybody will be happy. I could overeat on kale. I can stuff myself with kale and I'll be fine. So it's not really the quantity, yeah. Is it getting like locally sourced product? It's better if you can get things locally. That is probably better because you're cutting, yeah, I mean, you're cutting down on your transport costs and all those things. That's probably if I can, but that would make me happy too. I'm talking about something that's gonna make me sad, something I would, have to reduce or cut out that actually will have the biggest benefit. Oh, oh no, I'm okay with the coffee. The, that's that's still that's still a, a plant, you know. There's still plants growing. They're helping the the earth. Even the sugar that has to be grown, and those are not always the nicest things. But that's still okay because it's a plant. Maybe I'm yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I don't want, yeah, plastics I do would like to reduce. That's true. But look at me. I have that glass thing in the paper. I'm good on plastics. And you do want to reduce plastics. But there's something even bigger than this. And like I said, it's making me sad. Oh, yeah, see, most people don't actually know. I just read it today. Reducing meat consumption. Oh. Reducing the consumption of animal products. Because these plants are, you know, helping us out with their little plant stuff. But the animals just go in and eat all these plants. And the amount of plants it takes to feed all the animals. And then they're belching and they're pooping and they're doing all this stuff. Especially if they're not local cows, if they're coming from far away. Then, yeah. So that's the most effective thing I can do. Like I said, it, it makes me sad and I'm not going to do it. But if you really want to. If, if that's the, in the kitchen, that's your most effective local choice because, because Alex, what's happening? What hap What's happening with the, the coffee and the climate and all that stuff? So I, I only listened to it briefly, but it was pretty interesting. So um, because of climate change, a lot of the crops are dying because of heat or too much rainfall. So they're not able to produce as much. So now it's costing more. Because what is being produced and have to pay the people who are producing it, they're not making enough to make a big profit. So the prices are right. This is a bummer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh I yeah, I looked at this study and it said that by 2050, which is not that far away, that there may be as much of a reduction of by half of the land, you know, the land that would be suitable for growing coffee. Now, they said that maybe new areas could come on. You could maybe grow it higher than they used to be able to grow it. Maybe further north, they'll grow some coffee up in Vermont. Maybe Oneonta will become a coffee grower. I don't know. Hopefully not, because that would, uh, yeah, that would be, that'd be rough. And I think, Alex, you mentioned also the bugs. I mean, you know, that's the problem with climate change. You never know what's going to happen all of a sudden. You think it's just getting warmer, but then the bugs, the bugs are able to come out. 